Hi everyone, my name is Rudy Seitz and I'm on a mission to explore new musical worlds. And I'm here to share with you a piece of music called Tin and it's canon number 85 in a series of musical canons that I've been working on since 2014. I promise you that if you watch this video, you'll make a new friend and that friend will be a new piece of music that you can connect with and appreciate. And I promise that we won't talk only about music, but we'll also see some photographs and uh, talk a little bit about architecture. To start off with, uh, I'd like to play you the opening section of the piece. Now, in order to get the most out of listening to this piece, I need you to take note of three different aspects of it. The first is the rhythm of the piece. The second is the structure of the piece. And as we're gonna see, it has a wavy or undulating structure. And the third is the story that the piece tells. And we'll see it's a story of emergence. Let's start with the rhythm of the piece. If anyone is ever inclined to tap along to a piece of music that I've composed, uh, I'll feel very happy because to me, that's a sign that the music is doing its job. But Tin is a piece where if you try to tap along to it in a steady way, you might find yourself confused as to where the beats lie. That's because Tin uses um, a cycle of seven beats, so it's, an, it's written in an odd time signature, seven, eight. But if you keep in mind the rhythm, or one two one two one two three one two one two one two three one two one two one two three. You might find that uh, the rhythm of the piece suddenly clicks. So let's try listening again together, and I'm going to say these syllables as we as we hear it. Daka 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 da daka 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 daka. One two one two one two three one two one two one two three daka 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 daka. So that covers the rhythm of the piece, and now let's talk about the structure of the piece. And in order to understand the structure of the piece, I would like to focus in on the bass line in the opening section. So when we listened to it, we heard the bass line together with the soprano that's copying what the bass does. And now we'll hear just the bass line by itself. You'll notice that this bass line in the opening section consists of four distinct phrases. Now, I wonder if anything stood out to you about that bass line as being somewhat unusual or unexpected. One thing that's unexpected for me is that the bass line keeps getting higher and higher and higher, um, and it doesn't seem to come back down. I've drawn a diagram to show you how that looks. And these black dots here, represent the note that we hear at the beginning of each measure 
in the base. So it's the beginning of measure one, beginning of measure two, beginning of measure three, and so on. And we can see that um, from measure one to measure two, the bass line gets higher by a small amount, and then it gets higher from measure two to measure three by a slightly larger amount, and then a small amount, large amount. The small amount is the distance between do and re. It's a major second. And the larger amount is the distance between do and fa. It's a perfect fourth. And we can see that the bass line consists of this alternating pattern of ascending major seconds and perfect fourths. I have a second picture that shows what the bass line looks like when we hear it together with the soprano, and we can see that the soprano um, is following the exact same pattern. It's just skewed over by one measure. And since both the bass and the soprano are following the systematic pattern uh, in how they ascend, the relationships between the notes of the bass line and the soprano line also follow a regular pattern. This diagram, we can see those relationships. We can see that they, the bass and soprano create a uh, perfect fourth the first time they occur together, then a major second, then a perfect fourth, then a major second, then a perfect fourth at the beginnings of each, me of each measure. This might look vaguely like a DNA double helix. And in fact, this is the DNA of the piece. This structure serves two purposes. Um, first, it creates a regularity or consistency to the sound world of the piece. For me, it gives it a sense of place. The second uh, function that this structure serves or, or did serve for me as I was composing the piece is that um, it, it enabled me to take my next steps in writing the piece, right? So uh, Tin is not a piece that I could have simply um, put onto a blank page without any structure or scaffolding. And this was the scaffolding that allowed me to bring this piece into being. Now, um, we've talked about this ascending opening section. Um, I've traced this diagram on the other side of the page, and that other side of the page shows us what happens in the second section of the piece where the soprano leads us downward and the bass follows, uh, follows the soprano down. This happens not one time, but four times in the piece. So we have uh, an ascent, descent, an ascent, a descent, an ascent, descent, and then a final ascent and descent. Let me play you just the soprano line in the descending passage. And if you remember the bass, the bass's ascending line, um, try to notice whether the soprano line as it descends has the same mood as we heard before, or whether the mood has changed. So you might notice that at the end of that soprano line, that descending line, um, we experience a bit of uh, brightness or cheer that wasn't there at the beginning. This leads us into the third uh, aspect of the piece that I want to share with you, which is the story that the piece tells. In this image we see, I, I've drawn a few little uh, rays of sun here as we descend, and that represents that little bit of brightness that we hear in the, in the eighth of those uh, eight phrases that we've seen, that we've heard so far for, for ascending phrases and for descending ones. Um, when that little bit of brightness first occurs, it does not take a dramatic spotlight 
it doesn't, uh, it's not something that the, the composition lingers on or emphasizes. It's something that just passes by and then we continue um, ascending and we're back into that dark, busy mode that we started in. I'm gonna play you that, uh, I'm gonna play you this, this portion of the piece right now so you can hear it for yourself. a little bit of brightness and then we went back to the dark. Um, what happens after we go through this process three times with a changing uh, relationship between the bass and the soprano, so the, the experience of these peaks uh, is, is different each time but they're fundamentally following the same pattern, finally the composition emphasizes that brightness and gives it the, the, the stage, the, it gives it center stage. And the way it does that is to take that uh, final phrase from the, the soprano line and um, feature it with a new accompaniment, a new bass line b below it that has the purpose of emphasizing it um, and supporting it rather than serving as a counterpoint that creates complexity and, and busyness that might, that might distract us from the dramatic um, quality of, of that soprano line, which again is, is, is brighter and happier than the, the place where, where we started. So let me play you uh, what that sounds like. So we have an emphasis of the of the brighter uh, the, the the brightness in the piece, and then we go back to the the dark uh, quality that that it opened with, and we go in for one final uh, ascent, and, uh, and then we descend again, and finally we end in the bright light. Now, this piece was written; uh, it was finished in May of 2020, um, and it only had three peaks at that time. You may remember that. Uh, May of 2020 was a time when the world was getting used to wearing masks and um, there was a question as to whether we needed to sterilize our fruit and uh, many people were quarantining uh, and I spent my quarantine uh, working out this piece. I listened to it uh, over uh, the next year and wanted more from it and the, the uh, I went back to revise it at the end of 2021, and that's where this final ascent and descent uh, came uh, came to be. Let me play you what this sounds like, and I'm going to uh, wave at the the moment in this piece that I would consider to be uh, the magical moment. made sure not to play the very last note of the piece because I'd like you to listen to it for yourself. I was trying to think of uh, some images that represent the, the different aspects of this piece and the first image that came to mind is this picture of government center or city hall in Boston and this is a famous example of brutalist architecture which is a style that's known for uh, exploring geometric patterns that are often expressed in raw concrete, large, heavy slabs of concrete. And it's a style that is considered um, more imposing and massive than it is uh, pretty and welcoming. 
And this, for me, represents the way the piece opens. Uh, it's a kind of heavy, dark opening, and it's somewhat imposing. As the piece goes on and that brightness emerges, uh, this image comes to mind. And it's an image where we see this beautiful pattern, and behind it, there's another pattern, and there's light uh, that's penetrating these two layers of pattern. Uh, and, 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 and reaching our eyes. Another image um, that comes to mind when I think about the process of emergence in this piece is this one, where uh, we are inside a dark barn, but there are cracks in the wall of the barn letting in uh, the bright sunshine, and there's enough sun coming in to illuminate these uh, green vines that are growing inside. And finally, I thought of uh, this image of the Bunker Hill Monument in Charlestown. Uh, and what stands out to be about this image is, again, it's a, a massive structure that has uh, a, one side that's in the sun, another side that's in, that's in the dark. Fundamentally, these surfaces are the same. They're flat, uh, massive uh, faces of this monument. But the experiences of being on this side versus this one are quite different. And in the piece, what I feel uh, happening is that we start in the dark and we kind of peek around, peek over this edge a few times, and finally we end up on this, this bright uh, face of the monument. Should you choose to listen further to Tin, uh, you now know about the three most important aspects of the piece, the rhythm of the piece, the undulating structure of the piece, and the story of emergence that the piece expresses. And I hope this equips you to enjoy the piece even further. I wish you happy listening.